thank you guys very much. You did a great job leading us in worship. We're in Acts chapter 4 still, though we'll come o- go over into Acts chapter 5 today as well. We're in, still in the series entitled, The Church Called and Empowered for Gospel Mission. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through chapter 5, verse 11. You were just seated, but if you would, please stand again for the reading of God's Word. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, For as many as were owners of lands and houses or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet." But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. You may be seated. I want you to think today about an event that put the fear of God in you. I remember as a seventh grader, new to middle school, we had an assistant principal named Clay Gillum. He was the junior high basketball coach and assistant principal. He seemed to have arms like trees. He walked the hall with a paddle that seemed about this big. And one day I remember him grabbing one of my classmates, 
telling him to grab his ankles and he proceeded to use that paddle on him. And in my seventh grade mind, I don't know if it was reality or not, but he seemed to lift him off the floor. I want you to know that that got my attention. As a seventh grader, I wanted nothing to do with Clay Gillum's paddle. I don't, I can't say that it put the fear of God in me, but it put the fear of Clay Gillum's paddle in me for sure. Luke was writing in this passage about episodes and adventures in the life of the church. Here he described an event that happened. He described the early church's experiences regarding giving and finances. Through these events, through these experiences, they learn to fear the Lord. Now Luke was writing to encourage, to warn, to instruct future congregations like ours. And like these other churches, we should respond well to the Lord regarding our giving and finances. And through that, we should understand and live under the fear of the Lord. I want you to follow me as we work through the parts of this passage and seek to allow the Lord to do His work in our lives and our hearts today. The first part of this passage comes from verses 32 through 35, a summary of the early church's practice. In these verses, Luke describes what the early church was doing, as he often did. In verse 32, he emphasized their unity. They worked hard at unity and being unified, being together and doing the Lord's work together. In verse 33, we find them again at the practice of proclamation. This early church understood clearly that the Lord God before time had determined that yes, He would send His Son to be the Messiah, to be the Savior of men. They understood clearly that all men were sinners, that all men were separated from God, and that God had intentionally sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on a cross for mankind's sin. They preached that message and they called people everywhere to repent And to experience the forgiveness of God. And to become a part of the church and then to help others experience the same forgiveness and salvation. They were all about proclamation of the gospel. This statement in this passage is an extremely important statement in understanding the whole passage. They were about, they wanted to be about the proclamation about Jesus and helping people to know Jesus. But also in this passage, Luke described for us how the church was at work meeting needs. They were collecting their goods. They were pooling their goods in order to help meet the needs of the people. Now let's ask the question, was this collectivism? Was this socialism? This was a temporary arrangement for their situation in the present. You see, people had gathered from all over the 
Mediterranean world. They had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came. The gospel was preached. And 3,000 of them were saved. 2,000 of them were saved later. The church was growing and doing. People were staying in Jerusalem longer than they meant to. They ran out of money. As you would do if you stayed too long somewhere. They... Their jobs were back at their homes, but God had them in Jerusalem for this situation in the present with His church. Is this collecting of pooling of resources, all of our resources for us? No. We need to learn something about interpretation, application of Scripture here. Again, we need to understand the context of how and why this was happening and compare that to the teaching of the rest of Scripture. Paul taught something very different to churches. In Ephesians 4, 28, he commanded the church to help thieves and other sinners stop stealing and start working with their own hands so that they could support themselves and eventually help others in need. In 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul wrote to Timothy that anybody who did not take care of his own family, and especially his immediate family, was worse than an infidel, worse than a pagan, called on them to do so. Similar teaching in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. And in 2 Timothy 3, 10, he said, If they won't work, neither shall they eat. I like to eat. I'm going to work. Paul was teaching something different. Something different than what this experience was in Acts chapter 4. It was a temporary matter. How does it apply to us? Well, yes, we collect resources. We put resources together for the meeting of needs and for the proclamation mission that God has given us. The general teaching of the Bible is that every believer should tithe. That every believer should tithe and through those funds, God supplies the needs of His church to help the church to function and so that our proclamation mission may go forth. I believe that every believer needs to be a part of a local church and they ought to tithe from their gross income to help the church and for the church to be able to function as God calls us to do so. Now I know there are some that do not like it when preachers preach about finances or tithing. But my thought there is simply is God's not just interested in your finances. God wants all of you. He wants every cell of your body, every thought of your mind, everything about you to be in submission unto Him, to be obedient unto Him. And when we're that way, yes, tithing will be one of the ways that we obey Him and follow His leadership. He simply wants all of you. But back to this passage. Let's turn from a summary of the early church's practice to a positive example. In verses 36 and 37, Luke told us about a very positive example of what they were doing. Barnabas. God had blessed him. He did what the church needed and was doing at the time. The way they were doing it at the time. He seemed to do this. He sold a piece of land and brought the proceeds for the church to use as a part of its work. 
He seemed to do this willingly and eagerly. He had integrity and openness in what he did. Luke gave us a positive example in Barnabas. But notice the next word in the text. It crosses us over into chapter 5. Recognize that the chapter divisions and verse divisions came later. Uh, We did not have those in the original. So it's see the connection between chapter 5 and what is in chapter 4. He gave this positive example in verses 36 and 37, but... He's about to give us a negative example. And that negative example is Ananias and Sapphira from chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. This is what Barnabas did and the way he did it. But here's a negative story, a negative example about two who did not do it the right way. And again, we need to understand chapter 5, 1 through 11, this story about Ananias and Sapphira as being in the context of the early church. Again, not descriptive of the ongoing practice of the church. But recognize its connection to what Luke is trying to emphasize for us here. What happened? You have these two previously unnamed believers, Ananias and Sapphira. They sold a piece of property. And in agreement together, a premeditated plan... They kept back a part of the sale or the, of, from the income for themselves. And they brought the rest, the remainder. It doesn't tell us what portion it was of it. But they brought that and laid it at the apostles' feet. The presumption was that they were giving all of the proceeds of their, this land. But here they were guilty of deception. Guilty of dishonesty. Guilty of being fake and phony. They were guilty of appearing to be doing one thing, but actually doing something else. They were guilty of blatant hypocrisy before the Lord. They were lying to God. In verses 3 and 4, Peter discerned immediately what was happening here and confronted Ananias. He called him by name. And he asked him some key questions here. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Why have you kept back a part of the money for yourself? Who did it belong to before you sold the land? And at, at, what dis, at whose disposal was it afterward? And who made you think of such a thing? And he concludes verse 4 with the thought you have not lied To men, but to God. Verse 5 tells us that Ananias fell at his feet and died. And that great fear seized all of them who heard of it. Would that get your attention? If somebody that you knew was being disobedient to the Lord, fell out dead, would that get your attention? This passage gets my attention for sure. In verse 6, Ananias' burial took place. In verses 7 through 10, 
we have the story of his wife, Sapphira, and her demise. She came in, entered three hours later, not knowing what had happened. Jumper's theory is she'd been out shopping. (laughs) She was racking up on some of that money that they kept behind. But she came in and Peter asked her a question to discern her involvement and her response. Did you sell this land at such and such a price? She agreed with what her husband had said. And Peter responded to her as he had done to Ananias. How could you agree? How could you contrive this premeditated plan together? And he asked her the question, how could you test the Spirit of the Lord in this way? It's as if, he, he didn't say it here, it's, it's implied, it's as if he asked her, didn't you know that the Lord would know what you're doing? Don't you understand? He's omniscient. He would know what's going on. On And Peter said to her, your barriers are here for you. She fell out dead just like her husband had done. They came in and carried her out, buried her by her husband. Again in verse 11, we have the response of the early church. That great fear seized them all. I believe that's a major point of this whole section. Peter, uh, Luke emphasized it twice. Points us to, to a focus of the passage. Great fear seized them all. They understood something about God and they learned to fear the Lord. Was there sin Selling land and not giving all of it to the church? Well, no. Again, you have to understand the context here in chapter 4. Yes, it was in that context, but not that's not a general teaching of the passage. I think the questions that Peter asked of Ananias and Sapphira are questions that help us get to the real problem. Allowing Satan to fill our hearts with a plan to deceive. Lying to the Holy Spirit. Keeping for yourself what is really God's. The real issue here was the attempt to deceive God and His church. The real issue here was lying to God about their level of commitment. This was premeditated hypocrisy and deception. They were not recognizing God's omniscience. God knows. God sees. He knows our hearts. He knows our actions. He knows where we are. He knows what we're doing. They were not recognizing God's holiness and God's justice. They were using, they were trying to use a religious act to gain worldly recognition, they were trying to use a religious act to make themselves look better to the other church folks. They were using deception to make their commitment and sacrifice look greater than it was. I believe a central part of the problem here is that their deception, their hypocrisy affected the mission of the church. Again, I think 33 is verse 33 of chapter 4 is a central verse here. Why does Luke re-emphasize that the apostles 
were at work proclaiming the message of Jesus, highlighting His resurrection to the people around them. Their deception, their hypocrisy affected the mission of the church. Well, it affected it in the sense that they didn't have as many funds to use, but yet, Always, always hypocrisy and lack of integrity of a congregation always, always affects the accomplishment of mission. We must recognize that. Peter, again, accused them of lying to God about what they were doing. Certainly you may have questions here about their punishment. They fell dead. Who or what killed them? Was it God? Was it their sin? We need to recognize that God is serious about sin. We need to recognize that God is serious about His church. The church is the bride of Christ. God is serious about us walking with Him, walking with Him in obedience. He is serious about premeditated, deceptive sin. Would our punishment be like theirs? Well, no. We don't find God doing this multiple times through Scripture, but yes, we find Him doing this some through Scripture. We think about the guys who touched the Ark of the Covenant when they were told not to. I think about Achan in Joshua chapter 7. Would our punishment be the same? Well, no, but I'm not going to test God on this. Malachi 3, the Scripture tells us that God said through Malachi to test him on tithing to test and see he said bring all your tithes into the storehouse and test me on this God says and see if I don't bless you because of it that's the only place I know of that God says to test him I'm not going to test him any other way I'm not going to test uh in disobedience, test him in hypocrisy, test him in in open deception. We also need to understand that for those of us that he allows to live on in life, we will stand before him in judgment at the end. We will give an account to Him, and the Scripture says we'll give an account even of every idle word. I don't want to test Him. I fear Him too much. I fear the Lord. I don't want to test Him at all. Some would ask here, what about God's mercy and grace and forgiveness? Well, I'm confident if if Ananias and Sapphira had repented... God's mercy and grace would have been abundant to them. Yes, God is a God of mercy, grace, and forgiveness. All we have to do is is look at the cross to understand that. But He is also a God of righteousness and holiness and justice. We need to understand who God is. But now let's turn our attention to some application. Some lessons. The lessons to learn are warnings from this passage. What should be our response to this strong, this powerful passage that Luke describes for us from the life of the early church? What should be our response? Well, our first response is simply to fear the Lord. Again, twice. I think he's emphasizing that for us. The church, because of these events, learned to fear the Lord. 
What does that mean? Well, to fear the Lord is to recognize His omniscience. He sees. He knows. Let me take you back to my middle school days. We had a, an English teacher named Mrs. Hodges. I remember her standing, pounding feet on top of her desk, trying to get our attention once. She's quite a character. But one day she left us alone. Why she did that, I don't know. But she went to the office for something, left us unattended. Well, we took advantage of that situation. And during our party we were having, someone said she might be listening to us. And sure enough, we had an intercom system at our school. And just as that person said that, we heard her voice over the intercom. You are ought to be sure I'm listening. Numbers tells us that your sin will find you out. Our sin always finds us out. We cannot escape that. Uh, it always comes back to us. I remember once when uh, my younger brother and I, we were just old enough that our parents would leave us at home alone. They were going to the funeral home or something and going to be back in a couple of hours and left us there at the house by ourselves. The last thing they said to us before they left, no fighting. Well, they had not been gone 15 to 30 minutes. We tied up. And I don't know which one it was, but one of us threw the other one over his shoulder and somebody's heel hit the sheetrock wall and put a heel-sized dent in the sheetrock wall about three-fourths to an inch deep. It was about this far from the floor. We tried to figure out, okay, how can we move furniture around to cover it up? Can we put a picture over it? But it was just in the wrong place at the right height. There was nothing we could do to hide it. Well, we suffered the consequences when parents got home. Your sin always finds you out. God knows. God is omniscient. We can't hide from what we do. To fear God is to recognize His omniscience, yes, but also to recognize His holiness and justice. To recognize that we are accountable to Him and will eventually give an account to Him. He will hold us accountable. To fear God is to recognize that God expects honesty, integrity, genuineness in our relationship with Him, including our giving and our finances. You can't fool God. He sees and knows. To fear God would be for us to learn to simply be real. Be real before God. Have integrity in all things in our relationship with Him. Let our walk match our talk. If we say we're following Him, we say we're in covenant relationship to a church, then live that out. Be real before God. But another lesson to learn, a warning here. Fear the Lord, be real, but third, do not hinder the church's mission. Again, I think that's central to this passage. Their actions, the actions of Ananias and Sapphira, hindered the mission of the church. It interrupted it. It hindered what God was doing through 
the proclamation of the gospel. My encouragement to you is don't test the Lord in this. Don't hinder His mission in any way. Find ways to help to advance His mission. Do your part in giving and service and support the health and the mission of your church. Don't test Him in that. God is God. God is jealous for His church. He loves His church and He calls us all to obedience and following and to be real before Him, to be a part of His church, doing His work, advancing the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Again, we should do all that we can to be a part of that, advancing His work of gospel proclamation. Let's bow together, please. Our musicians will return and you're going to have an opportunity for response. Your response can take place in your seat, here in prayer with me, or here in this altar. Now or later, whichever you prefer. But I encourage you to respond to what God is prompting you to do because of this passage. For some, that means salvation. You're lost. You are separated from God because your sin. You need to understand. You need to know if you persist in resisting the Lord's work in your life. You'll pay the consequence for that. God offers you salvation. He sent Jesus His Son to die for you in your place. And He calls you to turn to Him in repentance and faith and experience His forgiveness. Believers, what do you need to do to help put your life in, in line with and in obedience to this passage? Whatever that is, it may be something you need to pray about today, repent of today. It may be something, an action you need to start soon, a way to help this church be what, what God has called it to be. Or simply pledging yourself before the Lord to be real before Him because He sees and knows. Father, help us. Lead us, Father, to be obedient to You, to be faithful in responding to the call, the demand of this passage. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's stand together. I'll be here to help amen. you. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you for your attention today. If God... Is it working you and you need to see us about this message in your life? We'd love to talk with you and try to help you and guide you along with, with your response. Uh, but praise the Lord for His, His Word. Let me share some announcements with you, some opportunities for us to uh, move forward with our work as a church. Next Sunday, a lot of things going on next Sunday. Uh, uh, the Connection Team... We'll meet next Sunday at 3.30 p.m. This is a uh, retooling, vision casting meeting for our connection team. If you're interested in being a part of the connection team, just show up. You could call the staff and let them know you're coming, but just show up. Uh, they need to know about child care by tomorrow if you need child care for the meeting, though. Our students will go on a retreat later in the month called So Much More. And there will be a parent informational meeting next Sunday after each service in the overflow room. So if you're a parent of, a, of one of our students going on the retreat, show up for that uh, information meeting next Sunday. We continue to need folks who are praying during this time. 
and praying in our prayer room. If God calls you to do that, there's a sign-up sheet in the prayer room. Again, go out these doors and right around the corner and you'll find the prayer room. Sign-up page is there on the wall and we invite you to be a part of that ministry. There's a prayer guide. Uh, it's a blessing to do that. You're simply devoting time to pray for what's going on in here during the worship service. We continue to need volunteers in the Discovery Park and Hangar, especially on Wednesday. See our staff go online and sign up to do that. Next Sunday, we'll observe a baptism, so you give attention and prepare for celebration to do that. Tara Dunkel, one of our own, will be leaving about the end of the month, first of next month, to go on mission to a country in the Far East. Uh, we are going to love her and support her, pray for her. The next two Sundays are two special events. On the 12th, next Sunday, there will be a reception and support gathering meetings for her after each service in the cafe. Uh, you give attention to that. And then on the 19th, we'll have a commissioning time, prayer time for her. That will be her last Sunday with us on the 19th. So you prepare for those. You start praying for her. Let's give her a hand and thank the Lord for her going out from us as a missionary. Today, we want to finish our service in prayer for one of our staff members. Uh, Greg Allen, our children's minister, he was, the plan was for him to try to break away and be here with us for this prayer time, but uh, obviously he's still working, working with, with your children. On February 17, Greg and his dad will go through kidney transplant surgery. Greg will be giving a kidney to his dad who is in severe need of a new kidney. We want to love Greg, pray for Greg, help Greg all that we can through this experience. Today will be his last full day of, of contact with the children, trying to prepare for, be as healthy as possible going into the February 17th and then he'll be out recovering for about six weeks. Some folks have stepped up to be leaders to help